I, I unbuttoned the top button, so I think it's okay. It works out. So uh, I see a lot of familiar faces. My name is Satya Thal. I'm the director of the Financial Markets Working Group at the Lucada Center. Um, and I know a lot of you, but not all of you, have attended some of our other courses, specifically the one geared towards understanding the financial crisis. So this is our, uh, I think this is our fourth in that series. Um, and both of our speakers today have participated in those previous courses and uh, the evaluation quite positive, so I'm excited to talk about that. Both of them are members of the, of the Financial Markets Working Group, which is sort of a surgical uh, strike task force, uh, triage task force, ER, sort of, some sort of emergency response system uh, to, that's geared towards understanding the financial crisis as well as suggesting uh, policies that may, that may mitigate the, the downturns we're experiencing right now offer up alternatives to the dominant paradigm, uh, and to answer questions. And that's, that's what we're here for, is really to give a presentation. But the, the, the core of these courses is, not, is a, the opportunity to ask questions and think through in a collaborative way so the answers to the issues that we're dealing with right now. Um, I'll introduce them briefly. First, we'll have Professor J.W. Barrett, who's a assistant professor of law at George Mason University. He uh, has been doing research in uh, securities, corporate law, and corporate governance for a number of years. He's worked in the private sector, also has worked in the judicial branch in, uh, in, in Delaware. So he's been on various sides uh, of policy debates. Uh, he's been in the trenches, he's worked a lot with the SEC uh, on a number of issues that we, they work with. And second will be um, Dr. Garrett Jones. Professor of Economics at George Mason University. He also has spent time outside of academia. He was uh, an, econo an economic advisor in the Senate, as well as a uh, staff member at the Joint Economic Committee. So he has been in your shoes, so to speak. He's, he's been uh, congressional staff before uh, and has a whole bunch of different various degrees from different places I won't get into because uh, it goes to his head. I'll just give a brief intro uh, of today's topic. Today we're trying to focus on TARP and its various iterations, especially in light of the recent Treasury or so-called Geithner plan. Um, the idea is here not to provide a blanket criticism of the plan. Uh, there are both, I think, both our speakers agree, some good and some bad, some clever and some not so clever elements in the plan, but rather to think through the implications of those, as well as to all offer alternatives um, Gary and I were talking briefly before about the little glimmers of hope we see in the markets. Um, you know, we're awaiting first quarter earnings reports from a number of major financial institutions, Goldman Sachs, JP, Citi, uh, and there's some expectations that we'll actually see increases in earnings and maybe some, glimmer, some signs of return to profitability. Um, I don't want to put too fine a point on it. I don't want to put too fine a point on it, and we're not here to prognosticate exactly when the recession will end and when we'll see recovery, but I think it's relevant to start thinking about uh, an exit plan. Now, what we've got from the administration and Congress, both this administration and the previous one, were various roadmaps, kind of set of directions, but no roadmap or directions are complete without a destination. And I think what we're lacking is an exit plan. What exactly are we looking for? What, how do we define success? And once we're there, how do we back ourselves out of it? So it's certainly relevant, it's important, it's crucial to understand how do we lay into the institutions, fix what needs to be fixed, but then once that happens, God willing, how do we back ourselves uh, out of it? And I think uh, to various degrees our presentations today will uh, help us think about not only what are alternatives to the road that we're going down, but how we know when to get off the, the freeway when, when we get there. So without that, I'd like to start with Professor Brett. Thank you, Sadia. And uh, it's good to see. I see a few familiar faces in the uh, crowd. I really appreciate it. Maybe that has something to do with the fact that there's no final exam at the end, uh, what keeps coming back. But uh, I, when I was a young man, my dad told me that um, he gave me a lot of good advice. One of the things he told me was, son, you only really need three things. Then 
Here he is a good tailor, a man who's a good bartender, and a man who's a priest. Um, and I've come to understand how important that advice really is. Um, at the same time, I don't think it does much good if your bartender is also your priest, if your tailor is also your bartender. It doesn't really work when you're trying to merge the roles. Right? I mean, you could imagine, when I'm, when I'm with my bartender, I'm not in any condition to assess the workmanship of my tailor. Um, and I really don't want my bartender to be my priest, because you know, one of them is supposed to forgive my sins, and one of them is supposed to facilitate, uh, uh, is supposed to enable my vices. Um, so it just doesn't work when you try to merge the roles. And I think that is ex absolutely uh, a, a consideration worth thinking about. The latest plan, um, the latest sort of fashionable idea, to let the Federal Reserve do everything. Now, the Fed is great. I think there are a lot of reasons why we all respect the Fed. But when we require the Federal Reserve to be both, well, to be all of the following, okay? Liquidator, lender of last resort, manager of monetary policy, prudential regulator of banks, and then finally, possibly, systemic, uh, system-wide systemic risk regulator. We're making the Fed wear too many hats, and I think we have the same problem of bartenders working as tailors and working as priests, moonlighting as priests. It's just not going to work. And it threatens the very qualities about the Federal Reserve that we like, and that's going to be a consistent theme in my discussion today. And it's a consistent theme of the Federal Reserve working with Treasury and getting new powers to regulate uh, and to get involved in, in backing institutions that they also regulate. It's a consistent theme of our discussion today. Before I get into TARP, Talk is mostly what we're going to talk about. I want to briefly mention something about hedge fund regulation, because I think it's intimately related to um, the, the bailout, and it's, the, it's the, the regulatory effort that's front and center right now after the G20. Uh, the ministers of the G20 were, were very interested in discussing hedge funds. I wonder if you sat any one of them down and asked them to define what exactly a hedge fund is, if they could really tell you, um, because I've been studying hedge funds for a long time, and I can't tell you with any level of precision what a hedge fund is and what a hedge fund isn't. But we know that we want to regulate. Okay, fine. Uh, before hedge fund regulation was cool, uh, I've been arguing that self-regulation can work in the hedge fund sector. Uh, if you want to know more about that, anybody who works in the financial services committee, I'm happy to talk further with them. But I think self-regulation is absolutely a, a strategy that can work in the hedge fund sector. It's how we regulate broker dealers. It's how we regulate accountants. And I think it's a method that we can, that could be particularly useful in the regulation of hedge fund operators. In fact, even Sarbanes-Oxley, that great zealous regulatory reform bill, um, decided to use a method of self-regulation. It said, you know, we want to specialize self-regulator for auditors in the PCAOB. Chairman Frank's uh, initiative to, to try to let the Federal Reserve um, regulate hedge funds, or at least one of his ideas about letting the Fed regulate hedge funds, uh, is also, I would submit, a, a self-regulatory strategy. The Federal Reserve is in part of self-regulating. The regional bank presidents, the president of the New York Fed, um, is chosen by the very banks that lend to hedge funds. The investment banks that lend to hedge funds choose the, the president of the New York Fed. And so, uh, while I don't think the Federal Reserve is an appropriate regulator for hedge funds, it is a self-regulatory organization in part. So, everybody's talking about self-regulation. Don't let uh, uh, opponents of self-regulation tell you they don't like it because they probably do and they just don't even know it. So self-regulation can work for hedge funds if you, if you prevent industry capture. I have some ideas about how to do that. The SEC would vet nominees to the hedge fund regulatory board, and uh, the SEC would be involved in rulemaking, but would, be, would have a, more of a hands-off role in rulemaking. Um, try to create a, a self-regulatory organization that could work. There have been a few of them that have been tried that haven't worked. They were designed to fail, I would submit, because they weren't designed properly. But I, I felt I would be remiss, and before I talk about TARP today, I'm not mentioning a little bit about regulation, because regulation and bailouts are, are you know, um, two sides of the same coin, I think. All right, now on to TARP. So, just a little bit about the dominant modes of TARP. So, the first thing I'll talk about briefly are the capital injections. Uh, that's the $250 billion that's going to banks, $100 billion more on the way. Um, after we stress test banks, we're going to... Think about whether to give them another $100 billion. We've already given them $250 under the Capital Purchase Program. Uh, Secretary Geithner altered the Capital Purchase Program and renamed it the Capital Assistance Program, CPP and CAP. Uh, that's basically what we're talking about, putting money into banks and taking stock back in them. And uh, with the stress test coming up, I think what we're basically going to do is 
Uh, we've, we've taken stock in banks, and now we're going to, for lack of a better word, take stock in banks. The second thing I'm going to talk about in most of our discussion today is going to be the public-private partnership issue. Uh, there's going to be 100 billion invested in that from Treasury. Treasury's also given 55 billion to the Federal Reserve's TALF program. TALF, so 55 billion in TARP money went to the Fed and TALF. It's going to come back when the Fed makes loans to these public-private partnerships from TALF. So the public-private partnerships are going to cost 100 billion plus a significant element of the 55 billion plus a ton of money from the Fed. This TALF is a huge program. And we'll get into that in a second. So first, a little bit about bank capital projections. So the last time I was here, in fact, the last two times I was here, I told you that I was a little bit concerned about the idea of, the, of Treasury taking preferred shares in banks, non-voting preferred shares. So it's a little bit dangerous for government to hold equity interests, have control over private industry. There are some issues that come along with that. Um, well, it, it turns out I think nobody told the Treasury Department about our discussion uh, because the Treasury actually decided rather than taking non-voting preferred shares, now we're going to take voting Common equity, voting common equity, and we're going to allow any TARP bank that took that that gave uh, non-voting preferred shares to Treasury to exchange them for voting common equity whenever they like. Now the strategy behind this is that hopefully this will um, help the tangible common equity ratio over the tier one capital ratio. That's a little bit of banking jargon, but both of them are just a measure to try to take what people, what the equity that the that the public owns in a bank divided by the outstanding assets of the bank, which are its liabilities, its loans. Um, assets and liabilities are reversed from banks because a, a loan is actually an asset for the bank. So we divide the equity the public owns in the bank by the outstanding loans, and we get that as a sort of a measure of what the public thinks about uh, how the public values the loan portfolio of the bank, or how risky they think it is. So these two ratios are similar. The only difference is in one of them, the numerator, is just bare bones common equity. The last person in line in bankruptcy divided by the outstanding loan portfolio. That's the tangible common equity ratio. The tier one capital ratio that was traditionally used in Federal Reserve uh, regulation was that was included a lot more than simply common equity. So Treasury's idea is, well, markets are really scared right now. So they are fixated on, market analysts are fixated on the tangible common equity ratio. Right now, we've given a lot of money to banks and we own preferred shares of banks that go into the tier one capital ratio, but not the tangible common equity ratio. I have an idea. Why don't we just magically change the nature of our ownership from preferred shares to tangible common equity? Now, I would submit that that will technically make the tangible common equity ratio look better, but really, I mean, it, it, it's only useful when it, when it represents a metric for how publicly traded shares of people that want to maximize, that desperately want to maximize the value of their shares, uh, are willing to put their own money, their own skin in the game, um, for a piece of the, of the residual interest of a loan portfolio. So this kind of an artificial change by an entity that frankly isn't interested particularly in maximizing the value of the shares, is in fact interested in propping up the very bank in which it's investing, is not going to do any good whatsoever. So it's a completely empty exercise to change the method of the holdings for the purposes of changing ratios around. But it's not an empty exercise for the purposes of uh, the actual effect of doing this. So the economic evidence is overwhelming. When governments own equity in banks, not only does the bank, uh, the, not only does the bank's bottom line suffer, but economic development in that country itself suffers. <coughs> we have evidence from India, Russia, Eastern Europe, South America, the, uh, the evidence is really overwhelming. I think there's also a greater risk, a tremendous risk, that that bank will require subsequent government bailout. Governments, and then that, that also that it will get, governments are very interested in bailing out banks in which they own equity, much more so uh, all other things equal than banks in which they don't own equity. Those banks in which governments have an equity interest will also be much more likely to subsidize lending to politically powerful groups. So in Italy, for instance, there are a lot of Italian banks where the government owns uh, 20, 30, 40 percent, enough to really have control over the bank. Those banks will lend more in the south of Italy than in the north because the Italian government, the, 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 the coalition in power in the Italian parliament, comes from the south of Italy. Uh, so I think, for instance, what we could see, potentially, and I don't think I'm being alarmist in saying this, is we could see Citigroup subsidizing lending in battleground states. Uh, 
uh, going into the 2012 election. It's absolutely possible. They won't have an explicit policy of this, but I think if you crunch the numbers, you'd see that it was the case. Also, um, banks tend to give regulatory preferential treatment to banks in which they uh, have an equity interest. So uh, when, when the Federal Reserve uh, uh, review Citigroup, it's going to review it much more favorably than it would uh, some other bank that didn't participate in TARP. And I think it, it changes the competitive uh, incentives of uh, the private banking industry uh, and, and provides some distorted signals about bank health. Uh, and it distorts the regulatory process uh, at the end of the day. Now, the Secretary's solution is he says, well, we'll just put it all in a trust. We'll put these shares that the Treasury takes and banks into a trust and everything will be fine. The trust will run it. It will be hands off. Um, interestingly, we don't have any details yet about the trust that is supposed to run the government's uh, equity in Citigroup. Uh, it hasn't been released yet. I think that probably has something to do with the controversy at AIG. When Secretary Geithner was president of the New York Fed, he put together a trust to handle the AIG shares that the Federal Reserve owned. Um, and uh, he, he, uh, obviously there was a controversy about AIG bonuses. Uh, I think there's probably an incentive now, uh, probably a rational incentive, to try to keep as much power over Citigroup as you can. Yeah, you know, the, the Treasury's going to get blamed for any public controversy involving Citigroup. So perhaps that's part of the reason why we haven't seen any trust documents. Maybe it hasn't been created yet, I would suspect. But even if, even if the Secretary executes a trust to run the Citigroup shares, similar to the one he did at AIG when he was president of the New York Fed, it still has some significant problems. First of all, those trustees are basically not liable to anyone. And to my mind, I mean, I'm not a trust lawyer, but I think a trust in which the trustee is not liable to anybody isn't much of a trust at all, is it? In the AIG trust, so the trustees are like directors in a way. And they're also like investment advisors, in a way, because they're running a large investment uh, advisory organization that the AIG Trust is, is trying to maximize the value of the shares for the taxpayer. And, and uh, as a result, I, I think it's analogous to think of the AIG Trust as an investment company, right? It's analogous to think of them as directors of a publicly traded corporation. Now, both of those groups I just mentioned are liable to their investors. In fact, they have an express fiduciary obligation to maximize the value of those investments. In the AIG Trust, it tells us that the trustee shall have no liability, provided they act in a measure, in, in a manner, in, 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 wait for it, in the best interest of the treasury. So not in the best interest of the taxpayer, not in the best interest of maximizing the value of the shares in AIG, but in the best interest of the treasury. Now, what exactly does that mean? I would submit it means whatever treasury says it means, and it makes the trust something of an empty exercise. The trustees can be indemnified by the trust for liability. No limit on uh, whether or not uh, whatever they get sued for is in good faith or not. That's something that, publicly, uh, that directors of publicly traded corporations absolutely do not get. And their compensation is not performance-based. And I would say that I think it might be a good idea that it should be, uh, that they should get uh, performance-based incentives to run the trust. So I think the great, one of the great ironies of Tarp is that uh, the story has been that deregulation sort of caused the crisis. So as a result, what we've created to run the, the entity that, that took an interest in Tarp is completely unregulated entities. Right? Uh, the AIG Trust is a completely unregulated entity. It's not regulated as an investment company, and it has no liability to outside shareholders. It has no liability to shareholders uh, in AIG. So any control shareholder in a publicly traded company, if you have 40% of uh, you know, GE, uh, all the other GE, you owe a fiduciary obligation to all the other GE shareholders under state corporate law. But uh, sovereign immunity will protect these trustees uh, completely. So I would submit that it might be a good idea to rethink that, and that's one of the recommendations we're going to finish with. Um, okay, enough about equity. On to the public-private partnerships. So the thought is that we'll use, we'll leverage about 75 to 100 billion dollars in TARP money into 375 to 500 billion in purchasing power, buy up toxic assets. Although we don't want to use the word toxic assets because it's too negative. So we'll call them legacy asset, assets from now on. Legacy assets. There are plans to expand this program to $1 trillion. Um, those plans will, will, will uh, have to include, it hasn't been stated explicitly, but they'll have to include subsequent investments of money from all of you. So Treasury's definitely going to come back and ask for more money. It's probably going to wait a while until the uh, 
public uh, fear over over the bailout and over AIG and all that dies down, but they're actually going to going to come back with hat in hand. And I think my hope with the discussion today is to offer some of the strings that potentially you should attach to any new investments fund. So the hope with the public-private partnerships is that it will allow some private sector price discovery. Um, it would subsidize private sector price discovery. But you wouldn't have the government just artificially setting the prices of these toxic assets. You'd have people with some skin in the game. Um, and and uh, that would give you a more accurate view of the value of uh, legacy assets. So there are two different iterations of this public-private partnership. Uh, the Legacy Securities Program and the Legacy Loans Program. Just to give you a little bit of basic mechanics. Legacy Securities Program will work as follows. So private investors will come along. Um, let's, say, let's say I'm a, a hedge fund interested in, in, in buying some toxic assets. I'll put $50 into an entity that's going to buy these assets. Treasury will put $50 into it as well. And we'll share 50-50 uh, any profits that this entity gets from trading in toxic assets, buying them and selling them. So I put in 50, Treasury puts in 50. Also, the entity can get a non-recourse loan from Treasury for another 100. So right there, we've got a, we've got a, it already sounds like a great deal, right? I can put in 50. I'm investing in 100. So I'm, I've, I've got 100% leverage. That leverage is non-recourse. So the, the, um, in the private sector, a bank would demand that everybody sign guarantees. I want you to sign a personal guarantee. I want your grandmother to sign a personal guarantee. I want some of your cousins to sign guarantees. Everybody you know who has any money signs guarantees, and then we'll make this loan. But Treasury's going to give a non-recourse loan. So Treasury's loan to the entity in which it and private sector individuals are investing is not going to have any personal recourse to the investor. It's only going to have recourse to the underlying uh, toxic assets in which this entity is, is um, buying and selling. In addition to debt from Treasury, that will be supplemented by debt from TALP as well. So the Federal Reserve is also going to loan to these uh, public-private partnerships. So lots of non-recourse loans go into this. Treasury is a co-investor in this. Um, also, I would add that uh, the Federal Reserve is a little bit concerned, and probably a little bit more concerned with the default on the loans, so the Fed has insisted that it gets to be first um, in when, when Treasury and TALF, the Federal Reserve TALF program, both loan to the public-private partnership, uh, the Treasury debt will be subordinated to the Federal Reserve debt. Uh, and the term sheets for the public-private partnerships are very unclear about how they'll be governed. So, it says that the um, They're supposed to be governed by uh, a private investor, a, a private investment manager, right, that will, that will run the public-private partnership. So you'll find uh, some really large bank to come in and run the whole thing. But, and it says that they'll have control of the underlying assets. But it also says that they shouldn't, um, uh, there's a waste standard that's not clearly defined. Uh, and one of the concerns with uh, potential participants is that Treasury will come along later after uh, whoever runs the public-private partnership makes a lot of money and say, well, no, that's waste, this is waste, that's waste. It's just not, very, not a very clear standard. And when there are political incentives to uh, sort of go after the rich guy, um, one of the concerns about potential participants that's keeping them away is that this waste standard will be used, uh, the discretion under it will be used in, in unpredictable ways. Um, a little bit of mechanics specifically, uh, investors in public-private partnerships won't be able to withdraw their money uh, until three years have passed, so there's a three-year commitment to invest, uh, which is fairly reasonable, and it will, will, the, the assets that it will be investing, the toxic assets that it will invest, is MBOs and CDOs that you've heard about. There's a restriction also that they were issued pre-2009, fairly reasonable, and that they had a AAA rating at origination, uh, which is not too restricted because there was all kinds of junk. That had AAA ratings at uh, origination. That's one of the problems, uh, and so that's that's not going to be a particularly restrictive uh, provision. So that's the legacy loans pro. That's the leg legacy securities program. Um, I mentioned that TALF, the Federal Reserve TALF, is going to supplement loans to the legacy securities program. Uh, so just a little quick uh, background on what is TALF. So the Federal Reserve said uh, long before. This idea of a public-private investment partnership funded by TARP came along. The 
Federal Reserve had an idea that, look, we're just going to send a, a lot of non-recourse loans out there for anybody that wants to buy up toxic assets, because it's very important that we get a market started in this and unfreeze the credit markets. So the Federal Reserve Talent Program involves um, the Fed giving a non-recourse loan secured by the underlying collateral of whatever is purchased with the loan with a 5 to 15 percent haircut. 5 to 16 percent haircut, sorry. Um, so, in other words, you're buying up a uh, toxic asset for 100 bucks. Who knows how much it, it's worth. Um, the, the, the Federal Reserve will basically lend you 85 to buy 100. There'll be a 15 percent haircut because the Fed's a little bit uncertain about the underlying value and is trying to minimize a little bit um, of the losses it might get when it, it ends up having to uh, start to, to seize uh, collateral. TARP is going to fund TALF, as I said, 15, 55 billion of TARP money is going to go toward TALF, and then TALF is going to go back to the uh, public-private partnerships that the Treasury is doing with other TARP money. The Fed started by saying we want we want to do 200 billion in TAP. Um, that goal has since increased to one trillion. So you might ask, uh, I mean, that, that's a very ambitious goal. I think um, hasn't gone well so far, right? So a one trillion effort is the goal. The first round of hey, we got TAP money. Somebody come in and put in applications for it. The first round, 4.7 billion is the main. Of the 200 billion currently available, so public-private investment partnerships hasn't started yet. The TALF has already started, right? So not much money requested from TALF. The most recent one, a couple of weeks ago, 1.7 billion in TALF money was asked for out of the 200 billion that's available. So the Fed's trying to give away non-recourse loans, right? And it just can't do it. So I think that gives us some idea about how investors will be interested in public-private part investment partnerships. Um, supplemented by TALF loans. Just TALF loans by themselves, they haven't been interested at all yet. Um, I think they're for the same reasons, and we'll get to that in a minute. Also, one other little distinction, the TALF loans are exempt from mark-to-market uh, accounting. That was it, that, that provision was uh, crafted before the reforms to mark-to-market accounting. So now, uh, it might be a little bit useless. Uh, banks have discretion whether or not to use mark-to-market, -market. and I would imagine now, under the much, much more generous mark-to-market -market rules, uh, they might be interested in marking even uh, uh, stuff bought with TALF loans to market. The big concern with the TALF loans is that they're three-year term loans. So the Fed's loaning money for three-year terms. Right? Very different from the other things the Federal Reserve does, because when it buys up very liquid treasury securities. It can buy them up, it can sell them. When it sells them, it gets money back from the market, right. which is what increases interest, interest rates. Um, so very liquid, easy, uh, much more maneuverable in terms of, uh-oh, inflation's coming, we better soak up some of the liquidity in the market. Um, not true with TALF loans, because they're three-year terms. The Fed, the Fed can't just call them in. Right. And there's not going to be any liquid market for TALF loans. Don't think the Fed's going to be able to just sell off TALF loans, because remember, they're non-recourse loans, right? Backed by collateral that nobody really knows how to value. So who really wants to buy a Federal Reserve TALF loan? It's going to be impossible. So that when the Fed decides it wants to uh, fight inflation in the future, if it has to, it's going to have a bunch of TALF loans on its, on its uh, balance sheet that it can't sell off and then it can't call in. So its hands are tied a little bit. Industry, of course, really wants long-term loans. The real estate industry is pushing for five-year terms. On TALF. It took a lot of effort to get the Fed to, to go from one year to three year term TALF loans, uh, and uh, there's a lot of pressure for it to go now to five year terms. That would tie its hands even more, uh, and it threatens to uh, limit the Fed's ability to manage uh, uh, monetary policy, I would submit. Uh, this is a little bit of the problem with the Fed is being asked to be a bartender and a tailor. So, the legacy loans program, the other aspect of the public private investment partnership. The capital structure is similar to the legacy securities program. So that we'll create these entities. Investors will put 50 bucks in. Treasury will put 50 bucks in. They'll bid on residential and commercial loans held by banks that are troubled. Rather than the Federal Reserve supplementing um, these partnerships, the FDIC is going to uh, uh, supplement these partnerships with non-recourse loans. So that's the main difference, really, between the legacy loans program and the legacy securities program is uh, uh, who, who are sort of supplements, and you can see how this was the result of some 
political compromise. The FDIC gets to say who's eligible to participate in the legacy loans program. Um, in terms of the sell, not the buyer, but the sell. So it looks at assets and it sort of does rough back of the envelope calculation of this bank has this loan in its books. Here's what we think it's probably worth. Uh, they get the power to, to do that because they're they're providing these non-recourse loans uh, to the legacy loans program. So uh, in a way. The objective behind public-private partnerships is price discovery from the private sector. But the FDIC's role in doing a back-of-the-envelope uh, valuation of the, of the toxic loans, of the legacy loans, uh, sort of limits that public sector price discovery uh, role of it. Leverage is limited to 6 to 1, so uh, much more generous leverage from the FDIC than you get from Treasury loans. Um, but at least there's some limitation there. Rather than direct purchases, this will be done by auction. So, uh, different uh, legacy loan funds will submit bids to a bank for its loans. Uh, and the bank then gets to decide whether to accept the, the winning bid or not. There's no mention of asset managers in the legacy loans program like there are in the legacy securities program. There's been some discussion in the white papers that summarize this issue from law firms uh, and from investment banks that uh, they, they wonder why that, that it wasn't mentioned because it seems uh, to be reasonable to expect asset managers to run this program like the last one. There's also a, a limitation um, that a bank can't sell a loan to a legacy loan uh, fund and also invest in the fund that buys that loan. Now that seems to be perfectly reasonable is you wouldn't want banks to use legacy loan uh, funds subsidized by the government as a sort of way to just create a sort of off-balance sheet entity to, to get junk off its books but still own some of the stuff it wanted to own. Uh, it, it sounds perfectly reasonable, but it all depends on how you define affiliate. Right? Because any bank that participated in TARP, I would submit, has Treasury as a control shareholder in that bank. Anytime your control shareholder is also the control shareholder in another bank. You're an affiliate with that other bank, at least under the securities laws. The banking laws are a little bit more uh, unclear about what an affiliate exactly means. So I would submit it's, per it's, it's a perfectly reasonable interpretation that all banks participating in TARP are affiliates of each other. And so I think that would limit the ability of banks to uh, sell to legacy loan funds. Now, the Treasury sort of gets to define these things, and I imagine if there's a problem, we'll just sort of change the definition on the books of affiliate. But uh, as it stands now, I think it would be an issue. So what is the, what's the problem with the, with the um, legacy loans program? First of all, there's political uncertainty. So we don't know whether there'll be a subsequent windfall tax um, from the government. There's a problem with the visa program. So anybody that takes uh, TARP money, has to limit their HB1 visa program. And hedge funds don't want to participate uh, in the public-private partnerships because they hire a lot of quant PhDs from overseas and they don't want that program uh, limited. And, and all the industry people I've talked to say um, that's most of the reason why the interest in, in, uh, in TALF and the interest in uh, public-private investment partnerships has been tapped. Um, there's some questions whether Treasury will be able to fund their commitments. And there are also some other uh, implementation issues about uh, provisions in TARP. I have a couple of recommendations at the end. I'd like to take a look at it to get a chance um, that might deal with some of these issues. Um, I sincerely hope we can, we, can, we can reconsider a little bit of the bailout plan. We're off to a good start, uh, and I think that there are a lot of good things about TARP, but uh, I think if we refine the method um, to consider potentially a global sunset provision for TARP, if we refine the application of some of the restrictions in the stimulus bill to TARP money, and if we refine some of the structure of, uh, of how we, we, are, we are about to require the Federal Reserve to do more jobs than it can handle, um, I think this TARP bailout can work, and I'm happy to discuss with all of you uh, uh, this in more depth. So uh, I thank you for your time, and uh, thank you all, some of you for coming back. Appreciate it.
coming out of here today. Before I get uh, going, let me uh, follow up on one of JW's points, where he noted that possibly, hypothetically, it's possible that some uh, TARP money, some government loan money could be used, possibly, hypothetically, for political purposes. Well, this isn't just a hypothetical uh, situation. This is something that has a long and notable distinguished tradition in American history. It was one that was followed by our great president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So, um, it was documented actually first by uh, Professor at my alma mater, uh, Leonard J. Arrington, a history professor at Brigham Young University. He could talk a long line of research. Just pay attention to where um, New Deal agricultural loans went. Did they, get to the, did they go to the parts of the country that were hit hardest? Or did they go to the parts of the country that were swing states? Where did the money go? It's just a very simple statistical test. People who for us, people who got hit the hardest by the Depression, or places where the vote was like 48%, 52% for them last time. I don't need to tell you where the money went. So uh, that, uh, that was a paper written in 74 in History Journal, and economists um, have followed up on it over the years. So um, in country after country, economists have studied uh, situations, as JW noted, where uh, banks, uh, where governments make loans, uh, where governments have big loan programs, where they buy equity stakes in banks, and again and again you find the same result, which is that it's often used for political purposes. Now, but, I mean, of course, that's just the reality of politics, right? You know some of that's going to happen. The question is, if it's 5% of your money being used for political purposes, maybe that's something you can live with in the real world. If it's 80%, well, you probably can't. So we're probably somewhere in the middle. So let me start off uh, with a little background about the uh, Geithner plans, plural. Um, I need to define a little bit of what, to explain a little bit why collapsing bubbles make us, you and me, all of us, normal American households, less less trustworthy. Um, so the reason why is because when a bubble collapses, your net worth falls. When asset prices take a big dive, uh, your net worth, which is your assets minus your liability, that goes down. So your assets are what you own. Things like for an individual family, it'd be like things like stocks, bonds, your your home that you own, furniture in there. And your liabilities are, things, are what you owe, loans, mortgages, things like you make a fixed payment every month, or we owe a fixed amount of money at the end of some term. Things that contract our contractual commitments. So if your net worth is really high, then uh, everybody wants to be your friend. So that's when you're popular. That's when you get all the credit, all the credit card offers coming in the mail. That's when um, the uh, guy at the car dealer says, oh yeah, we'd love to sell you a loan. We can get you a 2.9% rate. Uh, but if your assets are just about equal to your liabilities because home prices fell, stock prices fell, you're still the same person, you're still a nice guy, but all of a sudden, you know, you are not as trustworthy. <coughs> Liquidity, the ability to get money on a short notice, is the kind of thing that's only there when you don't use it. So let's see quantitatively how important this is over the U.S. history. This is from the Federal Reserve's flow of funds data, which you can just pull up on their website. And um, this is, goes from, they have data from 1953 to uh, the fourth quarter of 2008. Q7, wow. Yeah, so that's a typo. Sorry. So you can see that uh, during normal recessions, like during our last recession, uh, 2001, uh, net worth with the stock market, with dot com collapse, um, did, did, it hovered around zero for uh, a year or so. It just kind, of, uh, just kind of floated around zero for a while. So there was not an increase in net worth. During other big recessions, during the uh, OPEC embargo, uh, there was, uh, there was a, a net worth stopped growing. During the credit crunch of the late 60s, credit stopped uh, growing. But you don't really see any times when credit was actually declining in this sample. Oh, except for the end. So in the fourth quarter, and this is annualized rates, so it's not just, uh, this is a year-over-year uh, -year change. So this is their actual decline. So household net worth, households, uh, the private, private families, individuals, it's 15% uh, lower than it was a year ago. So you're just, on average, I mean, don't take it personally, you're just 15% less trustworthy than you used to be. So, but despite this fact, uh, banks are still lending a little more than they used to. So this is the same kind of thing where it's year-over-year year change. And uh, normally, again, you see that during recessions, it's a little, kind of a noisy series because there are other things going on, but um, during the last recession, um, uh, credit still grew about 2% even year over year in the worst year. Um, you see other times, when times get bad in the U.S., this is total credit at all U.S. commercial banks. This isn't all credit, but it's credit provided by U.S. commercial banks. 
to businesses and families. So bad times are right around 2%, and that's about what we are at now. So we're right at the at about at the low point of um, the time series. But it's this, we've hit these kind of low points in terms of credit before. So credit is there on average. It's going to different people than it used to. But um, it's still growing. And you, um, you have to look deeper into the categories to find categories where it actually went down. So people aren't using as many credit cards as they used to. That, that number's gone down. But credit unions are going a little more than they used to. So that's gone up a little bit. So on average, we still got some growth. So um, let's talk about, so there are these crises. You can see that there's this net worth means that um, you may want to keep in mind when people tell you that banks aren't lending. Part of the reason banks might not be lending as aggressively as you'd like is not because of something that's wrong with them, but because of something that's wrong with you. Okay? Something that's wrong with their customers walking in the door. So there are problems inside the banks. The toxic assets are genuine, real problems. But a lot of us are holding toxic assets, too. Our homes and our 401ks. So uh, the Geithner plan is designed to solve the banking side of this, which is what most of my talk will be about. Um, and there, there are two plans. The one that's kind of getting the most attention recently, which is the plan to overpay for assets. Um, and I'll define what I mean by overpay. Um, it's not pejorative. And the second approach is uh, what he's just rolled out um, with preliminary legislation about what, what, three weeks ago now, which is a plan to create a new regulatory architecture. And um, the nice thing about the new regulatory architecture is that it, um, it gives the Fed and the Treasury and FDIC jointly power to do things that six or eight months ago we were told were, that was good economics, but politically impossible. So Philip Swagel, uh, who served in the Bush Treasury, um, and gave a Brookings paper just a couple of weeks ago that's gotten quite a lot of attention in the economics community. And what he argues in there is that, yes, there were a lot of good things that would have been nice to do. It would have been nice to sort of impose some kind of speed bankruptcy on the banks by converting bank debt into bank equity. But that was just politically impossible at the time, he said. He said, economists who told me that we should just turn bank debt into bank equity as a way to fix things, they need to spend a little more time in Washington. That was his... So there were political barriers that kept them from doing the economically correct thing. So, and, um, but now it looks like times have changed. And with the new administration, they decided to, to, to do, to at least propose, among other things, a bill that includes the power to create speed bankruptcy. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's the thing that happened to Washington Mutual, where a bank went from unsound to sound in 24 hours. So the first plan, which is, gets the most attention, the plan to overpay for risky assets. So the big caveat, what I mean here by overpay is your plan is, it really is, for um, the government and with a little bit of private money to overpay more than the private sector is willing to pay right now for these things. And it, it turns out that the private sector is too pessimistic and you know they're just they're 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 just these sad sacks, they're these Eeyores just walking around saying, oh, it's a gloomy day. Um, if that's the reason the prices are low, then someday maybe the They'll, the EORs will talk, all turn into Winnie the Poohs and be happy, and then the price will go up and taxpayers benefit. Um, if the private sector is right and these uh, legacy assets or toxic assets um, are awful, then, then the funds could lose money, although the taxpayers could still be better off. You're not just an investor in the, in the U.S. government, you actually live in the country. So you have to count both the investor side of your life and the living in the U.S. part of your life. Do the math right. So uh, let me sum up um, the public-private investment partnership uh, by quoting Brad DeLong, who's uh, a proponent of the plan. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago when the plan came out, um, the plan to, uh, to buy up about a trillion dollars in uh, toxic legacy assets, he said that it seemed like there were only um, two economists in the world, two, excuse me, two people in the world uh, who believed that this was actually a good plan. Uh, one was he himself, Brad DeLong, who was a uh, Clinton Dass, a uh, Berkeley professor, a protege of Larry Summers um, back at Harvard, and a blogger of summer now. So it was, he was in favor of this, and um, Professor Bebchuk at Harvard, who's actually JW's, uh, who's he studied with. So two people in the world. Um, since then, there have been like maybe two or three other economists who've come on board saying PPIP is a, is a reasonable solution, um, but not a lot. 
Well, let me tell you the most sympathetic approach, the sy most sympathetic reading of the PPIP. So he says, the Geithner, fund, the Geithner plan, which you can call the Geithner funds, there are supposed to be five of these once they're said and done, I believe. The Geithner plan is a trillion dollar operation by which the U.S. acts as the world's largest hedge fund investor. So if you think that's what your government should be doing, then, you know, bully for you. So maybe it'll work out great. Um, the U.S. government is, uh, you know, takes a lot of big risks in life. Uh, I mean, they handle nuclear weapons, they negotiate treaties, they declare war and fight war. So there's a lot of risky things the government does. This might just be another risky thing that our government needs to do. So where does the trillion dollars come from? Again, this is from uh, DeLong's blog. Um, he, his fact is actually, if you Google Geithner plan, this is like the number five thing that comes up. So a lot of people must be reading this and linking to it. Um, DeLong actually went, you know, he, he goes to DC now and then, and, or comes to DC now and then and talks with these guys. So I think he gets some decent information. Um, so $150 billion comes from the TARP, it's equity officially. Um, $820 billion comes from the FDIC in foreign debt. And then there's this little 3% chunk of private money. So, so 97% government and 3% um, federal government. I mean, private sector. And those hedge funds, the pension fund managers who are going to run the program, they, they kick in an average a total of $30 billion. So let me tell you how this is working. Um, so one story is that the market is now irrationally pessimistic about these mortgage-backed securities. They're just, they're in fear and, you know, even though economists don't have great models of how people are just irrationally fearful, maybe they're, maybe they're just, you know, things are bad. Um, the way Paul Krugman, who's dismissive of this approach, the way he sums it up is he says, the Geithner plan's view is that there are no bad assets, there are just misunderstood assets. <laughs> so... The, uh, the approach is that they're, they're too um, pessimistic and that a, the PPIP is super leveraged and so these hedge fund managers who are running this hedge fund, each of them's running a $200 billion hedge fund probably on average, um, because they only have a little bit of skin in the game, because they only have three cents in the dollar of their own money on the line and they're the ones making the decisions, they're going to really take some big bets. They're going to buy some stuff that is absolute junk that might pay off in a really rare state of the world. But you know, if you only have to pay three cents to buy a you know, one dollar asset, and you get maybe half of the gain on that, so three cents for maybe a 50 cent asset, probably gonna take a lot of gamblers. So, um, so the leverage, the, the fact that these hedge fund managers are super leveraged, that, that sort of boldness that that will encourage them with might just balance out the market irrationality. So one form of massive subsidy to the hedge fund managers might just balance out on the scales the market's perceived irrationality. So then you buy a bunch of stuff. Um, because you're overpaying for this stuff, the bank's net worth rises. Um, their assets are now higher. They have this extra cash you handed them. Um, and uh, they're, uh, as a result, the healthy banks make some healthy loans. They get healthy levels of depositors. People like going to banks. They like depositing their money in banks that, that sound healthy. People like borrowing money from banks that sound healthy. Um, so both sides, on the both the deposit and the loan side, you'd rather do business with a healthy bank most of the time. And maybe things get better. And the story is that someday the market wises up and the market says, okay, we'll pay, we'll pay the, the guys their funds a lot for these assets. And then taxpayer problem. So the second approach is that maybe the market is correctly pessimistic. Things are terrible. These things, the reason these things are selling for 30 cents on the dollar, or some of these toxic assets are selling for 30 cents on the dollar, is because they're worth 30 cents on the dollar. Home prices are really low. A lot of people are going to default on their mortgages and walk away. Banks are going to renegotiate these mortgages under political pressure from, um, from a lot of your bosses. And so the reason these assets are worth 30 cents on the dollar is because Banks aren't going to get a lot of money coming in there. So they, 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 they look like junk because they are junk. So here the story is that you overpay. Um, and here because it's the, the investors aren't worrying about the downside. Bank net worth rises. But because they get overpaid, the overpaying itself makes the economy healthier. So you want them to overpay for stuff because there will be some kind of network effect. Where if all the banks get healthier, they build healthier networks, the economy gets a little better, 
One healthy bank, not a great deal, but if there's 10 healthy banks, it's, uh, it's a, you get a lot of positive spillover effects. So because of a better economy, the mortgage-backed securities become a better investment. So what these things have in common is that the government holds $1 trillion of risky assets. This is the point that Long makes a lot when he talks about it. The government holds $1 trillion of risk and takes it off the private sector's hands. So just as you don't have to do your own peace negotiation with, the, uh, with Vladimir Putin, that, that's a risky asset you have to hold. Uh, similarly, you don't have to hold, the private sector doesn't have to hold these uh, risky, toxic um, assets. So in that, let's banks, that lets private sector banks actually do what they're good at. Instead of worrying about these strange, um, very risky assets that they're not used to holding at all, they can do what they're good at. They can stick to their knitting. They can search for new customers, look for, check out the credit worthiness of normal business opportunities. They can build good relations with borrowers and lenders. You know, they can do advertising, great advertising campaigns that have uh, Regis and Kelly. So, you know, you just, you just do the things that banks are good at doing. And uh, this, this idea that when banks have to do things that they're really bad at, that's bad for the economy. When banks have to sweat over those things, that's bad for the economy. It's actually based on Ben Bernanke's research, the research that um, brought it to prominence. Both his historical research about what banks had to do during the Depression, and his theoretical research on how shocks to net worth can really mess up um, people's credit worthiness. So on both sides, he's, his theory and his <coughs> empirics, his history, both tell the same story, which is you would want to find a way, maybe, maybe the PPIP is the right way, maybe it's not. You want to find a way to get banks to stick to that edit. Don't, 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 turn, don't, don't make them be hedge fund managers, they're not good at that. So what else they have in common is, as um, JW noted, the, um, these 97% non-recourse loans where you're playing, and where the profits are split as correctly as, as, as Secretary Geithner knows, the profits are split between private sector partners and the government. Uh, but still, even so, roughly speaking, we're playing a game of heads I win, tails I lose three cents. And if you got that deal, if somebody hands you that deal, heads I win, tails I lose three cents, I certainly hope you flip that coin a lot of times. If anyone ever offers you this, you should just spend days and weeks awake just flipping that coin until the other party wises up and says, you really shouldn't be doing it. You know, I, I, the game's over. So flip that coin as much as you can. Take that opportunity. Um, so it could be worth it for citizens, even though it, you know they're taking a lot of risk with your money, uh, and they and they could lose a lot. It could be worth it for taxpayers as, as citizens, not as investors. Maybe we can hire GDP out of this. There's a lot of things in government that we do that you say, well, this might cost some money, but we might get some higher GDP, we might get some lower unemployment, and we might save on some welfare payments. So that's good. So you're you're not just an investor; you're a citizen. And uh, the current TARP assumptions, which are baked into, I believe, the, the, the budget this year, is that we lose a third of that money in the long run. You don't lose all of it, but you lose a third of it on average. It's just a way of taking account of the fact. It's the, it's the Obama administration's way of being non-utopian about it. It's a good thing to have, good trait to have, being non-utopian. <coughs> so you lose a third in the long run. So you have to ask yourself, would you take that deal? That's a quantitative question, but this gives you a sense of how to deal. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, the regulatory reform plan, which will certainly be heating up um, over the next few weeks, uh, is much is a way of saying uh, it's a way of both saying we want something like TARP and PPIP to be a permanent part of our life. We want these to be permanent tools that the government has access to, and at the same time, it's adding on a few tools that the government really wished it had had to have something other than normal bankruptcy for crippled banks, for crippled financial institutions. So really what you can think of this as is, is it's creating an FDIC for non-bank banks. So agencies like AIG, agencies like um, Lehman, uh, like Bear Stearns, agencies that don't fit into our traditional definition of an FDIC regulated bank, you want something for them that gets the, the benefits of the FDIC approach. Just to give you a sense of how good the FDIC approach is, Washington Mutual, I don't know how many of you have deposits with them, but uh, it went from being a troubled bank that was unsound on the verge of you know, having, having a silent bank run. It was actually having a silent bank run. I believe about 9% of their deposits were withdrawn. 
Now these people do that electronically, right? So you don't see the old people standing in lines or people standing in line at ATMs or at tellers. You don't see that. Just click, 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 click. So you've got to look at a different way than you used to. You can't cover news stories the way you did. So Wamu went from being trouble to save for 24 hours. Wouldn't it be great if we got a way to do that with other weak financial institutions rather than years in bankruptcy? Rather than what you're having to watch right now with GM, where they're negotiating and bickering and fighting, and trying to present some kind of what the president calls rapid bankruptcy for GM. I guess there's some way, especially when there's a whole bunch of things going on at once, to just solve that all at once. Yes, he has a lot of these powers. With Washington Mutual, what happened is that J.P. Morgan came in and said, came to the FDIC and said, I, I guess this won't go in the other way. Uh, but let's treat it as J.P. Morgan calling up. FDIC and saying, Washington Mutual, we'll take that bank off your hands as long as you blow off the junior debt holders, the unsecured debt holders. If you tell us that we don't have to pay them back dollar for dollar, we'll assume everything else, the secured loans, every single dollar of deposits, not just the insured ones, the uninsured ones, we'll take the whole bank off your hands. 1.9 billion. And FDIC, Sheila Bear said, good deal, done. So what happened? WAMU's debt went down, their equity went up. It was a debt for equity swap. And the, um, we just won the link of the chain at. And the, the bondholders are told they have to go to Washington Mutual's holding company, not the actual bank, but the shell holding company, to try to get some recovery if, they, if they're going to get something. So FDIC didn't spend a dime. They take a dollar of, of, FDIC, of FDIC's money to do this. It was just negotiation. FDIC used its power to just say, that debt, no, it's not secured, it's not guaranteed. So you took a gamble, bondholders, and you just lost. Sometimes, some days you win, some days you lose. So why, why can't there be a 24-hour turnaround for AIG or Lehman? I'm guessing that's what uh, Secretary Geithner and um, Chairman Bernanke and a lot of other uh, regulators in the industry have been thinking. Why would we have something like that for big, systemically important companies, especially when it's all going down at once, like AIG or Lehman? So um, the answer is that our law just doesn't make it very easy right now. So that's one. So judicial bankruptcy is really slow. And then here's the caveat. Even though we say it's really slow, Lehman was still sold in days. So there are some exceptions. There, you might want to keep in fact in mind that when people tell you these stories that we have to do X because there is no alternative, well, we had something that we did. Lehman really was sold in days. And, the, uh, and, and many of its employees is still still working uh, in different divisions in the U.S. or in, in Europe and Asia. And derivatives contracts are apparently genuinely a huge legal problem in bankruptcy because uh, it's almost as if at the moment of bankruptcy under current law, the whole all derivatives contracts expire at that moment, and everybody can go in and get what they want. Um, and that so Luigi Zingales, who's a big fan of of this kind of power, of making it easy for debt to be converted to equity in a crisis, make it easy for liabilities to be reduced in a, in a crisis at a, at a crippled, bankrupt firm. He, even he himself says, you really ought to find a way to, you know, to change this law about derivatives all blowing up at the moment of bankruptcy. But again, um, there will probably be some further work on this over the next year or two. Economists will look at the data, finance professors too, they'll probably be better at that. Despite the doomsayers, as far as we can tell so far, the, the collapse of Lehman itself didn't set off a swap crisis. Um, so when did the big spike in um, in bank risk and risky and the risk of bank debt occur? When did the big plummets in stock markets occur? Um, as uh, John Taylor notes in his new book, Getting Off Track, John Taylor, one of the leading um, macroeconomists of his generation, uh, almost certainly won a Nobel Prize one day, and undersecretary in the. In the um, he noted that he noted that it was the day of the Paulson testimony, not the day of the Lehman failure. So there isn't really that much. So when when the secretary said that it's the end of the world and things are really awful and we need to take over everything, that's when that you can really see the spike occur in the data. Uh, Taylor has the raw data. You can look at the raw data yourself in a number of places. My guess is over the next year or two, this might become an emergent. There'll, there'll be a, a big battle between these two hypotheses. A big vocal battle among prominent, between prominent economists, and finance professors, and pundits over what was the big collapse. 
what was the big, when did the big collapse occur? Was it the collapse of Lehman, or was it the, um, uh, or Paulson's testimony that did this? Paulson's announcement that we were undergoing regime change in the U.S. So, um, in just two minutes, I'll give you corporate finance in one lesson. Uh, as I said before, net worth is assets minus liabilities. It's what you own minus what you owe. There's two ways to get out of bankruptcy. The two approaches are the bank can, the government can just give you some assets to boost your net worth. Another approach is that the government declares some bond liabilities, some liabilities just null and void. It says those bonds, those things that you thought were a guaranteed contractual payment that you get ten thousand dollars in five years, well, the, the firm is sound. Um, and so now that's going to convert to flexible common shares, which are not liabilities. Bonds based on contract, stock based on hope, oh, trust. Not what I mean. So the government gives you a consolation prize with an upside. And um, the uh, new Geithner proposal for regulatory reform uh, includes basically making permanent versions of both of these and making it easier to do both of them much faster than we currently do. So the big policy choice that you and your boss will have to, to face over the next few months is what relative power you want to give for these two kinds of uh, ways out of bankruptcy for the weakest firms. Now, this one costs a lot of taxpayer money, and it has a long historic record of politicizing the financial sector, which may be good for some of your bosses. If, if your bosses are political, you know, have, have that kind of pull, that may work out great for you. So, um, you know, good lobbying opportunities down the road, certainly. So if you kind of connect with that. But uh, the other side involves uh, going down the WAMU approach of um, not making some tough decisions, turning bonds into shares, and fixing things uh, much more quickly. So um, here's a, the, a, a sheet from Bloomberg Terminal, a screen from the Bloomberg Terminal, showing the credit default swaps, which is the probability of bonds defaulting and implicitly being converted to debt, I assume you into equity <coughs> over the last few years. You might be able to see it in yours better. The top one here is a city. That's at about uh, 600 basis points. So it looks like over the next five years, roughly speaking, it looks like there's maybe a 6% chance uh, that a city, city's debt gets converted into equity. So they're certainly among the big banks in the US the most, apparently most likely to be speed bankrupted at, by the measure of the markets. So even if we find a way to do to solve the banking problem, whether through TARP, TARP Plus, PPIP, or the speed bankruptcy road of converting debt to equity, which is a power the Treasury now wants, either way, you still have to face what's going on in the household sector, which is that your balance sheets make you a worse credit risk. And that is a legacy that will probably be with us for quite a number of years. Uh, a couple of quick announcements before uh, we get to Q&A. I know some of you have to leave. Uh, as always, the yellow form is the survey, and we ask that you hand that to someone uh, by the door the staff by the door on the way out. The second is a couple of programming notes. Uh, tomorrow, our related program in the financial crisis series will be on systemic risk, and will feature Dr. Dr. Margaret Polsky. Um, and she has a publication that will be coming out tomorrow on the issue of systemic risk and a, and a financial stability or systemic risk regulator. And uh, the third and final thing, uh, you should be getting it in emails, but I wanted to point you to uh, our website, which is economicrecoverydigest.com, and we update that several times a day with the latest commentary, commentary from our scholars from around the country, latest news items, uh, and things like that. So with that, I'll turn it to you
rationale for that application. Um, and the other question I had was, um, so with this, uh, the coin flipping game, we tell people that they can uh, leverage up, you know, you know three, um, was it three dollars of equity into a hundred dollars security? I mean, how is that conceptually different from what we did in the housing bubble when we were getting people three uh, percent down payment uh, mortgages? What's the implication of that? Um, well, I, I can fix the first issue of uh, legacy securities program. What he's talking about is that there will be five legacy securities funds, each of which will be run by one investment manager, uh, and they'll sort of compete with each other. That's the hope, at least. They'll compete with each other to buy legacy securities. So one of the legacy securities funds is to pay 54, using you know some private money and mostly government money to compete. And the investment manager that runs the uh, legacy securities fund uh, you get some kind of a fee, a management fee, probably a performance fee, so they'll have an incentive to maximize profit. Uh, so they'll be bidding against each other, uh, each of the individual funds, uh, for toxic assets. And that'll help us to try to increase the price that we pay for toxic assets, because then we can use that price to mark all the other toxic assets that banks keep on their books. So the hope is that competition among the different managers will help to increase the price. Auctions tend to result in higher prices than, than not auctions. Um, at the same time, the, the, we'll pay each of them with a performance fee, try to keep them from overpaying too much, um, because they don't want to overbid and then sell things too low. The investment managers of the legacy securities programs um, will want to underbid. Uh, so they'll have them, but they'll still want to get assets that they think are a good value. So the hope is that that, that limits the problem of we want to bail out and we want to buy toxic assets, we don't want to overpay because we're going to the American taxpayer. Um, now, as far as limiting it to only five, I, I don't know. I, I would imagine there needs to be some sort of a limitation because um, perhaps there's some sort of scale issues that require us to just have some really, really big funds uh, doing this stuff. There was a limitation that if you're going to be an investment manager of a legacy securities fund, you have to have at least a $10 billion in assets already that you're managing, that you're running. So you need to be a $10 billion hedge fund uh, or whatever else. Uh, you know, there was some pushback on that, and the secretary said, well, we're going to do it this way, and we'll consider maybe setting up some small ones down the road. Uh, but he hasn't, he hasn't binded to that outcome. So it's still technically a, a $10 billion limitation. You have to be really, really big to run a legacy securities fund. First of all, you want private equity. Yeah, I would imagine that's, that's a perfectly legitimate thing. We don't have a, a ton of TARP money, so we have to, um, you know, we, we're limited in, in that, that we can't see too many funds because maybe there's some minimum level we need, size we need the fund to be in. We just only have enough to meet that minimum in five funds. Maybe that's part of it. Uh, I mean, I, I think your principal is right. I think if you, if you ask, you ask me to play Secretary Geithner, so that's probably part of the justification. Uh, that well, well, I mean, if, if the goal is just to allow as many uh, pigs to fit into the trough then, uh, as possible because there's some government money to be gotten, then yes, that's an argument for letting a lot of people up and having a lot of funds. But if your goal is to get good, get the best possible, I mean, given your crummy incentives that you've created, if you want the best possible solution to the agency problems, just look at the way it is right now. There's only going to be, out of this uh, trillion dollars, there's going to be uh, 30 billion of private money. Um, divide that by five, and that's uh, what? Uh, six billion dollars per person. I want somebody to have six billion dollars on the line if they're running this. If you divide that into a hundred, you're talking about people with uh, six hundred million on the line. And by in a lot of circles, I know not to close to you, but I, well, I mean, yeah, lot, so those of you who work on approach, you know, six hundred million is chunk change, right? That's budget dust. But, you know, in the real world, like on Wall Street, that's kind of chunk change too. So you want people to have like the, the best incentives possible given the crummy incentives you've chosen to create. So five competing against each other probably gets you enough to have some kind of competition in the price, um, but big enough that you get economies of scale, and where these portfolios might be might have enough different kinds of assets that you get the benefits of a balanced portfolio. I'm just I'm guessing I'm just trying to say what you know I'm I'm trying to searching for my inner Larry Summers. What would Larry Summers say if he's sitting at these meetings? Really smart guy. Good <laughs> finance. This is kind of you might say. On the second question of um, why. Um, how it's different from just the private sector doing it. The difference is that still, for some reason, the US Treasury and the federal government is a better credit risk than the average mortgage uh, buyer. That's the big reason. So the government you know, um, buying a bunch of stuff 
is it's actually handing them the cash, and people are convinced that whatever debt is out there is actually going to get paid off. So, you know, your neighbor just isn't as trustworthy uh, when he is as a when he's a private citizen than when he's uh, you know part of the U.S. Uh, federal government. We're talking about the um, the three percent is the private money, right? These, these yeah. legacy programs. So it's it's you know you basically. But that's only three percent. Ninety-seven percent is government sure. money. So that's what really matters. My guess is ninety-seven matters more than three. So. So those uh, ninety-seven three scenarios. Both of the scenarios ended up with taxpayers winning. Can't be that simple. Basically. That's exactly why I said how it could work. Okay, so what's the taxpayer to lose scenario? What's that look like? Uh, they buy a bunch of stuff and it never pays off, and it costs a trillion dollars. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's risky. Yeah. So as with as with many government decisions, there are, there's if you're looking for risk-free choices, you're not allowed to work in government. So. What I think is particularly telling is that this. Um, Garrett's exactly right. He, he, he gives you a, a sort of a flip the coin, 50 cents if you win, 3 cents if you lose. Uh, what I think is interesting is that the best hedge fund players on the street right, have been offered that bet, and they say, we are so concerned about the political uncertainty of the windfall profits tax and the visa restrictions, because we have a lot of talented people that we don't have to fire. We're not willing to take that generous bet. And I think that is where we get some adverse selection problem with this stuff. The people who really want to be partners with us in this public-private investment partnership don't want to be partners with us. They don't want to be partners with Treasury and the Federal Reserve. Not because they don't like them, it's because there's just too much uncertainty. Yeah. So you get uh, probably the worst actors participating. Very important point, yeah. Thank you so much for coming and have a good afternoon. Thank you.